Hello and welcome to the History with Jackson podcast. Today on the History of Jackson podcast, we welcome Dr. Simon Elliott. He is one of the leading historians of his period. He's a fantastic author and a great guy. So how are we doing, Simon? Oh, what a, what a big up. Actually, my day job, Jackson, I work in PR, so you should do my PR for me. That was amazing. I'm doing really well, thank you. And thank you so much for having me on your, your pod as well. It's fantastic. No, no, it was, it was, it was, a, natural, it was a natural link. I really enjoyed it. Uh, your book, which we're going to talk about today, Alexander the Great versus Julius Caesar. Who was the greatest commander in the ancient world? <laughs> That's a fantastic cover. I think Pen and Sword have done an absolutely fantastic job working with you and with the cover as well. So thank you very much, Pen and Sword, for sending this across. Now, firstly, Simon, thank you very much for coming on. And my first question for you is, how did you initially get interested in both these men? Um, I've been interested in the classical world as long as I can remember. So I can remember as probably a four-year-old, my dad coming over home from work with a load of computer blank computer printout paper, me getting a load of crayons, drawing a picture of a Roman chariot, because I'd already got a box of Airfix 172nd scale Romans, which had a chariot in, which is interesting because, of course, the Romans actually didn't use chariots. Um, but Airfix had one in, so I drew one. And there we go, four years old, um, drawing pictures of Roman chariots, uh, playing with the Roman soldiers, beginning to learn about the classical world. And then, then one of the things you find with history is that there are some incredible figures in world history, aren't there, uh, Jackson? And two of them jump out to me, even when I was very young. Julius Caesar was one, obviously, uh, and also Alexander the Great. My son's called Alexander, by the way, because of Alexander the Great. So, so, so from a very early age, I was genuinely interested in the classical world, and I became fixated on these two key figures from the cl- classical world. I think that's often what we do as historians, don't we? We tend to learn about something when we're young and just it becomes a lifelong obsession. And you can certainly see that with yourself from FX models to naming your son Alexander. I think that's I think that's great. Now, who were these two men? Who who were the two men? So Alexander the Great was uh the conqueror of his entire known world by the age of thirty two. So, 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 run the run the maths here. Um, he was born in Pella, which is um, uh, in Macedonia, sort of northeastern north uh, northeastern Greece, um, in three five six. And by the age of thirty two, he conquered his known world, and then he died in Babylon. And you're only going back sort of um, one hundred and fifty years to the Greco Persian Wars when the Persians are about to conquer. The Greeks, and all of a sudden, here we are, here we are with Alexander conquering the Persians. So, so, so he was one of the great military figures, great political leaders of of the ancient world. Julius Caesar seems to be the the same at first glance because he was also a conqueror, he conquered Gaul. Um, he fought across the entire sort of Mediterranean, east and east and west. But it turns out when you look at both of them, they're very, very different figures. Um, Alexander the Great was the heir to Philip II, who was a great king in his own right of, of, of Macedon. Whereas Julius Caesar, although his father was a leading patrician, had nowhere near the same um, introduction to the top end of society that Alexander the Great did. So they both have di- very different careers. Now, I'd, I'd really like the point there, you, you're zooming in on on both of their respective families. Yeah, How, how different we've very briefly touched on it how different were these these families uh, and how strong were rome and macedonia at this point as well so so the periods we're talking about are in the uh, latter half of the fourth century bc that alexander the great so born 356 dies 323 um, julius caesar <clears throat> is born 100 bc and he dies in 44 bc so let's look at the two periods so for the Macedonians, they've only just at the point Alexander's born in 356, they've only just become the dominant power across Greece. And most Greek city-states at that point still thought that they were uncouth northerners. Um, and it's only through the military reforms of Philip II, who, who completely reformed the Macedonian military into the finest military machine of his day and for the next 150 years, that they were able to dominate <clears throat> the rest of Greece. And that's what Alexander the Great inherited. Um, and as Philip II died and Alexander the Great became king, 
uh, Philip II had been planning sort of a crusade for the Greeks to defeat the Persians <clears throat> across the Levant into and towards Iran to set right what, what they had perceived had gone wrong in the Greco-Persian Wars. Uh, so that's what Alexander the Great had inherited. That's the world in which he sort of grew up, and that's what he was expected to participate in to the point his father died. Julius Caesar uh, was born into the latter stages of the Roman Republic. So the Roman Republic is founded 509 BC. And as you get into the first century BC, it, it becomes increasingly racked with civil war. And that's because all the political classes were gradually gathering huge amounts of wealth by defeating, later than Alexander, obviously, the Hellenistic kingdoms in the Eastern Mediterranean. And therefore, the likes of Caesar and all of his contemporaries, like Pompey, for example, or earlier, uh, Marius and Sulla, were fighting each other. So you have the first century BC, wrecked with civil war in the Roman Republic. Now, Julius Caesar... Um, is the leading warlord of his sort of time because for a variety of reasons he's the most successful of these leading roman figures which i call in my biography of julius caesar sort of uh, late republican warlords um because he's got a, a he's, he's very good at leading his men he's very good at communicating a message to all levels of society he's a very good soldier he fights in the front rank but also he's a very good general uh, and and he's the leading man of his day uh, and the romans at this point had conquered both the eastern and the western Mediterranean. To my point, they were increasingly gathering huge amounts of wealth from the, the former Hellenistic kingdoms in the east, so the, the rich in Rome were growing richer, setting them against each other. And in this first century BC, the Roman Republic finally finishes in 27 BC. So if you want to look at the key dates in that first century BC for the Roman Republic, you have Caesar born in 100 BC, Caesar being assassinated in 44 BC. Well, then finally the Republic ends and Augustus is proclaimed imperator in 27 BC. Two very, very, very different things. And it's, it's interesting to see similarities and differences between the two, the two respective states, if that's the best word for them. Um, now we've looked at what's what's preceded Alexander and what's preceded Julius. What were their what were their lives growing up like? You know, these are two incredibly powerful men, and we tend to think of them at the apogee of their power, and we tend to neglect their youth, their education, and so on. So, what were their early lives like? Their education like, and how different were their educations and early lives? They were both defined by the early deaths of their fathers. So, uh, again, to my point. Uh, when you talk about Alexander the Great, if you want to look at the military <clears throat> history of the Macedonian world and the Hellenistic world, Philip II is as important as Alexander the Great because it's Philip II, his father, who created this incredible military operation. He invented the Macedonian fa pike phalanx, um, which was the anvil to the Macedonian companion shock cavalry, which was the hammer. So the hammer and the anvil, the, 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 the pike phalanx pinned the enemy line, when a weakness of, uh, emerged, then the, the companion shot cavalry smashed through with their lancers. And he also de devised a fantastic sea train as well. So it was a combined arms operation. It completely and utterly revolutionized warfare, actually. All under Philip II, which Alexander the Great inherited. And it's that, at the point his father was assassinated, when Alexander became the king, that he could then take to conquer his entire known world. But he inherited the ability to do so from his father. Caesar's father also died at a young age. So Caesar's father was, uh, so remember, Alexander is the heir to the Argaid throne. So he's the heir to the kingdom of Macedon. Okay. Caesar isn't the heir to becoming the ruler of Rome. At this point of the Roman Republic, you have two elected magistrates every year, consuls who, who run Rome. There's no king. Um, the political class is much broader and at the very top, you have the, the senators, the patrician class. Uh, and Caesar's father was a senator, was in the patrician class, had been the governor of the province, had been a consul, had been the governor of a pro the province of Asia, which is the most, is, which is, um, which is uh, Western Turkey. And um, there he had made wealth, but not incredible amounts of wealth. Um, and basically, you get the impression that, that his Caesar's family were just another of, of the senatorial classes, not, not at the very top at all. Um, however, Caesar's father died when he was 16. Apparently, he was bending down to tie shoelaces and had a heart attack. And from that point, Caesar, who had no brothers, became the head of the family. 
Uh, and that's one of the driving forces apparently behind his life that, that he knew from a very young age that he'd become the head of the family uh, because he'd got no brothers. And of course, that set him on the path to greatness itself because when uh, his father died, Caesar becomes the head of the family and it's right at the heart of the, the, the initial phases of this late Republican civil wars in the first century BC when you have the Optimates pro-Senate party and the radical populares of which Caesar's family were members who seized on this young man, 16-year-old, and actually started over-promoting him into positions because they thought that he'd be useful to them, and that set him on the path to greatness. So they're both defined in their early, uh, their, their early lives by the early death of their fathers. And you can, like, as you said, it is very clear throughout their lives, the influence of that, and for Alexander, the benefits. And Alexander inheriting the throne is his rise to power in Macedon. How does he go about consolidating that power as a young man it's, it's interesting actually because um well, the word consolidating is an interesting word isn't it jackson because consolidating to you and i <clears throat> means just sitting down having a think listing out your resources making sure that everything's organized <clears throat> taking your time reflecting alexander did none of those things basically he immediately invaded anatolia so he immediately um, went on the offensive again the per against the Persians, and you get the impression he got no choice. You've got to remember that that the majority of the Greek city states weren't didn't have kings at all. They 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 were various kinds of oligar oligarchy or democracy, etc. But they certainly weren't monarchies, uh, which set Macedonia apart. Even though it was becoming more Hellenized and was the dominant power in in in, in, in Greece, and uh, you get the impression with Alexander that the Macedonian nobility fully expected this young man who'd become the king inheriting his father's military machine to crack on you know it wasn't an option to sit down and count things up and work out what was the best thing to do you just got to crack on and actually that fitted alexander's character because basically he liked to crack on so he immediately invades anatolia and then over the period of the next uh, few years fights a number of set piece battles against the persians at granicus river um uh, uh, and ultimately the key battle at gorgamila with darius the third, one of the most unfortunate um, rulers in history because he found himself against Alexander the Great and he wasn't up to the job, fleeing into the upper satrapies and suddenly Alexander the Great defeated the entire Persian Empire. It's an incredible story. Going back to my in initial point, this is a man who was born in Pella um, in Macedonia in northeastern Greece who dies in Babylon. At the point he was born, Nobody would have guessed that he would have died in Babylon. They'd have guessed he'd have been just another Macedonian king if he'd have lived long enough to actually make a name for himself. And that's that's a fantastic point that no one would have thought he'd got there. And it's interesting to see, you know, he he just decided to crack on. It was expected of him. Now on the on the flip side, Julius Caesar, um, you know, he's defined much like Alexander by his father's death, but he doesn't have as easy or straightforward rise to power what what happens or how does julius caesar rise to power for the for the senatorial classes the patricians in rome if you're a man you you had to follow an aristocratic career path called the cursus honorum you didn't have a choice so this would in, this this would mean taking on a variety of different magistrates magistracies uh, sort of junior, then mid-ranking, and finally very senior. And at each stage, you're progressing, say, three or four years in each magistracy. Mag magistracy and um, the progression could take you to being in charge of um, uh, uh, the water supply in Rome, or you could become the commander of a Roman legion, and everything in between. Okay, More or less, you could influence it, but you're expected to follow this career path. And ultimately, you could become a consul. And then if you became a consul, one of the two uh, senior magistrates in Rome, then you could become a proconsul or a governor in a Roman province and make lots of money. Um, so uh, you're expected to follow that career path. However, the whole thing was sort of like set askew by the fact that at the time Caesar engaged with the, uh, the, the cursus honorum, at a very young age, by the way, 16, very unusual, um, we have everything happening at the height of the civil wars between the Optimates and the Populares. So at one stage, uh, the supporters of Marius might be um, 
uh, in the ascendancy. It's another state as the 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 the, 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 pop, the populares. It's another stage. The supporters of Sulla might be in the ascendancy, the the leading figure in the optimates, and indeed Caesar himself fell foul twice of Sulla and had to flee. One of the times he fled was when he was captured by the Cilician pirates, again in western Anatolia. Um, so although Caesar is progressing along the Cursus Sonorum, everything gets sort of like um, sort of set skew with, as it were, because of all this civil war engagement. And ultimately, Caesar see, begins to see this as an opportunity that he um, <clears throat> realizes that if he can outperform his rivals, and he sees ways of doing it, is very good at actually working working out how to outperform his rivals, then he can move to the top. Uh, and and so what he does is he sort of I can almost imagine him in his own mind uh, working out where the next moves were going to come, which got him into a position where he could become sort of a senior general, then a governor, and that kind of thing. But the one thing to remember is this: Caesar's family were never rich. It's a bit like uh, Winston Churchill in the Second World War, actually. Um, Caesar's family, because they weren't rich, weren't able to bankroll Caesar's ambitions. So you have this young man seizing, seeing opportunities, beginning to follow follow his dream, but the family don't have that much money, so he has to start borrowing money. And that's one of the driving forces of his life from that point, Jackson, because what happens is that Caesar borrows money, and then he achieves what he wants to achieve, whether it's in southern Spain, whether it's uh, in his initial engagements in Gaul. But as he begins to achieve his aims, he's then due to pay the money back. And if he can't pay the money back, he could get sued for it and that could destroy his career. Two things you need to be good at if you're a Roman senator, fighting and the law. Because you're always going to be fighting and you're always going to be having someone coming after you to sue you. The only two positions where you don't, you're, you're not exposed to being sued in court because of the position being so important are if you are a proconsul, a governor, or you're a con the consul of Rome, right? So Caesar suddenly realizes that he's got to spend as much time as possible as either the consul in Rome or more easily away from Rome becoming a governor. And one of the reasons why he ends up going to Gaul is because he does a deal in Rome that takes him out of the orbit of the people after the money. And then he becomes the, 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 the proconsul um, in southern Gaul. And that's the, the, the basis for him launching his Gallic conquests. And then later, what causes the um, conflict with the... Um, Optimates, the sort of like um, reactionary classes in, in, in the Senate in Rome, is because they fix it. So after he's conquered Gaul, he has to come back without being the consul so they can sue him to get the money back and they know they can destroy his career. So therefore, he, when he comes to Rome, he crosses the Rubicon with a legion, uh, the 13th Legion, and then he enters Rome uh, and clearly he's saying to them, you can do what you want to, but I've got a legion behind me. And that's the point when you end up with this final cycle of civil wars against Pompeii and the Pompeians, which leads to him being assassinated in 44 BC. He's, he certainly has a, a fascinating life where he's going all over the place and seeing that money is a, a driving force in his rise to power. Uh, it doesn't seem too dissimilar to some things that happen today in politics across the world. Uh, and being, yeah, being able to draw parallels uh, makes Caesar perhaps more relatable to a modern audience. No, you touched. I think that's a really good point, Jackson. I agree with that. Yeah, he's he's a fast, and he does. He's perhaps he's perhaps no has no contemporary you can align him up with, uh, but nonetheless, he is a relatable figure. Now, you you mentioned these conquer. I'll tell you one thing. I'll tell, tell you one thing actually. Just 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 if you'll forgive me, Jackson, just to draw a thread there. What <clears throat> in terms of modern politics, in the modern world, one thing that both of these figures were very good at was PR. Um, their own public relations. So Alexander the Great actually took historians with him, um, who, who he then killed. <laughs> but he did take historians with him. So he was in charge of the way that <clears throat> the narrative was written to his contemporary audiences about what he was achieving. By the same token, Caesar, we, we know nearly everything about Julius Caesar today through the words that he wrote or dictated himself. So he's the most successful PR man in the ancient world. One of the most successful PR mans in the world, ever. Because because he's he's dictated to us to this day while we're talking now about his career, all the facts I've spoken about to, about Caesar largely are what he's told us, uh, which is interesting in its own right. You think of a modern politician who'd love to be able to do that. 
So just as, just as a follow up question, then how reliable are these sources on Julius Caesar then, and and perhaps Alex Alan, Alexander because he's bringing these historians and you know I'm, I'm glad it doesn't happen anymore. He's killed these historians. Uh, <laughs> you know how relatable are these primary sources then? Well, um, the great thing about being an archaeologist, which I am, is that you can uh, sense check through the archaeological data all of the historical data that you've been presented with. And broadly, most modern appreciations of the classical world more broadly, actually, but certainly with Caesar and Alexander, uh, take into account the broader archaeological picture. And, and most of the time, um, the broad facts seem to be accurate. Now, from a historiography point of view, clearly, today, we know that when we're reading anything written by anybody, historian or not, it's written from a viewpoint. So one, the historian has to take into account that you're taking it through a viewpoint. Secondly, in the classical world, that's far more the case because there's very little alternative uh, narrative. So everything we know about the Parthian Empire comes from what the Romans probably tell us. Everything we know about the Gauls comes from what the Romans tell us. We don't. There's not a great big books of, of original Gallic prose saying, you know, the Gauls did this and that. We know about it from the Romans' perspective. So it's even more the case. So you have to be careful as a historian handling data, even acknowledging the fact that a lot of the key facts we can corroborate. Yeah, I, th- I think definitely from your point, it seems more difficult as a an archaeologist, an ancient historian to to actually have to set like to actually have to bring a, a together these facts um not so much like a modern historian who we have a, a plethora of, of sources where we actually have to corroborate them all together to actually get the true story um it's a very interesting way of having to work um which i i do not envy at all sometimes <laughs> I've got I've, I've got three bookshelves behind me, Jackson, which have basically got the key texts which still exist, uh, which are relevant to my own research uh, on the classical world. <clears throat> classical world. So that's three bookshelves, right? So that's probably naught point naught 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 one percent of things that have been written from a, in, in any contemporary context about the events of the classical world. Okay, so that it's minuscule. Um, Compare that to to the data that a historian from the medieval period, certainly the modern period, has, and it, and and, it, and it's completely um, skewed. However, what we do have now, which we wouldn't have had say two or three hundred years ago, is fantastic archaeological data, and um, the archaeological data are often, in my experience, from um, classical world archaeological sites, is better than from a lot of modern world archaeological sites, just because there's more interest in it. So actually, it just tend to help give you a bit of balance. But either then, let's go all the way back to my original point. As a historian, you've always got to be aware when you're writing about the classical world, you're dealing with a limited number of references, and they are always massively skewed in the direction of the person who it's written by or on behalf of. That's a, that's a really interesting insight into the craft of, of your own history and the writing of other historians in your period as well. It's a, it's an insight we don't often receive as historians or fans of history. Now, we've looked at the, the early life of both these two men, the the events and the family that preceded them. I want to look at their, their military careers because ultimately they are two of the most successful, outstanding military commanders that the world has ever seen. When do they really start to make their mark and and dominate as military commanders? Alexander the Great immediately. Uh, from the I mean, from the time I mean, he fought. I think he was sixteen when he fought at the Battle of Carnosophile with his father, <clears throat> where they defeated the combined Theban and Athenian army, which gave them dominance in Greece. And Alexander the commander the the, the cavalry, and uh, uh, as a very very young man, sort of uh, made the crucial sort of charge, which won the battle. Uh, he leading the cavalry, the hammer, Philip leading the phalanx, the anvil, the hammer and the anvil. Um, so from a very young age. And then as soon as Alexander becomes the king, he's doing what every Argade Macedonian king needs to do, lead from the front. So when, when there's a cavalry charge of the companion cavalry, Alexander does not have a choice. He's got to be at the front. He's got to be at the tip of the wedge of companion shot cavalry, the lance arm shot cavalry. He has no choice. Okay, He's been born to it. He's been bred to it. He's been taught it. If 
at any point he falters in doing that, you you have one job <laughs> as the Argaic king to lead the cavalry into battle from the tip, and that's it. Uh, and if he falters, then the nobility might chuck him out. Um, so he has to do it. He's got no choice. And, and from a very early age, that's exactly what he's doing. And then as soon as he immediately engages as king with the Persian Empire, he does that. So he fights a number of set-piece battles. He fights a number of sieges. He's always leading from the front. Uh, he's using this amazing military machine that he's invaded with his, uh, from his father. Very quickly, actually victorious. Really intriguingly, actually, Jackson, the, the more I dug, and you may have picked it up in the book, the more I dug into Alexander's career, I, I often think now, and I didn't think it until I researched the book, actually, that actually Alexander, at a strategic level, was outmaneuvered by the Persians in his first two campaigns. Because in his first two major campaigns against the Persians, um, Granicus River, for example, the Persians actually um, forced Alexander to react to them. And then it's only when the, the meeting engagement takes place on the Persians' terms <clears throat> that at this amazing military machine that Alexander's inherited from his father is so effective that actually the Persians have got no chance. But at a strategic level, initially Alexander's outmaneuvered. Uh, then he fights his A-game battle at Gorgamila where he's outnumbered uh, with horrendous odds. Um, and you're inventing numbers, to be honest. But certainly the, look, the odds look horrendous against him. But he's on his A game, fights an amazing strategic campaign because he's learnt on the job, and he again leads from the front. It's, there's almost a demonic quality to Alexander's leadership from the front. You can almost tell it's, it's, there's a Lord of the Rings or Tolkien-esque feel to, feel, feel to it. And certainly, if, if, if you know, you can guarantee J.R. Tolkien, Tolkien, when he was writing Lord of the Rings, would have been aware of Alexander the Great and would have used his ferocity on the battlefield as a leader as a role model for many of the leading figures that you find in things like Lord of the Rings. So it brings us all the way through to modern popular culture. Um, Julius Caesar also intriguingly inherits a military machine um, of his time. So, so, so the major figure in Roman politics of war around the turn of the second, first century BC is Marius, the great Marius. And, and Marius, at the height of the Cimbrian Wars against the Germans, completely reformed the Roman military machine into what we now call the Marian legions, simply because the, the Cimbrians were defeating the Romans time and again. So Marius created what we would today recognise as a Roman legion, with every legionary probably about 5,500 to 6,000 armed in the same way, all trained engineers, etc. Exactly what we would expect to see from a Roman legion. Well, Marius created that. And that's what Caesar later used to great effect. The thing with Caesar, though, is that Caesar was an innovator as well as inheriting the Marian legions. And in particular, he was very good at creating new legions. So when he, when he began his conquest of Gaul, 58 BC, he was given four legions. And when he finished in 52 BC, he got 12 so all the new eight ones, one was wiped out, by the way, and recreated. So there are nine new ones, actually. So of those nine new legions, Caesar had to find the money to pay for them by borrowing money. God knows why people were still lending him money, because you obviously clearly owed half of, he owed half of Rome money. But anyway, his credit was clearly good because he raised nine new legions. He then also promoted junior officers from one legion to become the senior officers of another and the centurions from a legion to become the junior officers of another. And so they became incredibly loyal, incredibly loyal. Um, and the other thing that Marius did, which Caesar took to an extreme, <clears throat> was he allowed the poor to join the legions. So there was now no longer um, um, a, a financial requirement that you had to be above to be able to become a legionary. So if you're from the lower classes in Rome or in Milan or in Ravenna, and um, you're suddenly offered a very reasonable middle-class salary and six years' service with possibly a pension at the end of it, you're going to not only take it, but you're going to be absolutely nailed on loyal to the person giving you the money. So Caesar inherited a system, but he improved on it. He, he sounds like an incredibly, I certainly got this from the book, an incredibly intelligent man who who knew what steps he was taking and knew the consequences or the positive outcomes of his decisions and i certainly really admire him if the two of them could play right <clears throat> if you put the two of them in an arena armed equally 
I think Alexander would have actually one to one out fought Caesar because there was a ferocity to his personality, which I think very few human beings can control. I go back to this phrase, demonic quality to his personality. If they could both play chess, Alexander would have no chance. And that's actually a really good analogous way of looking at the two different kinds of personalities. Because on paper, they look fairly similar, don't they, in terms of massive achievements, over, 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 over huge, li literally huge overachievements in their own lifetime. Um, but once you start drilling down, and I only did it in the context of researching this book, um, you suddenly realise you've got two completely different things happening here in actual fact. Yeah, one, one and it's, it comes down to their leadership. One, one led from the front and was you know, forced to, uh, and one would occasionally lead from behind uh, and be that general guiding force to his his own forces. And there you go. Caesar had a choice. Caesar had a choice. Caesar, when he needed to fight in the front line, did so. Picked uh, two or three times. <clears throat> picked up the, the the shields and the swords of fallen legionaries and joined the front line when he had to. Fought with great bravery, not in question, but but he didn't have to, and also you do get a sense, especially um, in the early uh, part of Alexander's conquest of the Persian Empire, that um, the army was almost relying on his ability to to lead personally from the front this military machine that Philip II had put together, almost like um, the military machine had been put together literally for Philip and Alexander to lead it like a sort of a glove kind of thing. Yeah, and I really like that phrase, the, the, like a glove, because it does it does seem to be suited for him, to him. Uh, and it's a it's a great way of looking at it. Now these these two men there, you know, there's a demonic quality to to Alexander, there's a very intelligent, cunning mind uh, with Julius Caesar. How do how do Greece and Rome react to these two men? Uh, it's it's the, their own region, uh, it's their own people. Well, it's a great, great question. Great question, great question. Um, <clears throat> with, that, with Alexander, so so let's go back to my original point that, that Macedon, king, the kingdom of Macedon, is viewed as an outsider, sort of a, a, amongst the Greek city-states, the uncouth outsider, the northern barbarians, as it were. Um, they don't like the fact that Philip II has come to dominate them. Athens, all the way through Alexander's life, um, um, <clears throat> never lost an opportunity to, to, to give him grief in one way, shape or form. And certainly when news broke of Alexander's death, one of the first conflicts uh, am amongst the, 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 the wars of the successors was um, Attica, led by Athens, uh, and, and fighting the Macedonians. So at the, the Macedonian dominancy of the Balkans never sat well with the Greek city-states to the south. And it's, it's fascinating you bring that through to today when you look at modern Greece uh, where Alexander's eulogised across the entirety of the Balkans. And it causes conflict between the, 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 the political conflict between the various nations in the Balkans about, you know, where is the true home of Alexander and that kind of thing. But at the time when he was alive, actually, um, the city-states in the south and the Peloponnese, certainly in Attica and Boeotia, he was, they weren't fans of the Alex, uh, Alexander at all. Um, with Julius Caesar, I think he was the doyen of the political classes until the point when they realised that actually <clears throat> he was going to outdo all of his contemporaries in the conquest of Gaul. And then suddenly that set the hairs running in terms of Roman politics. And that's suddenly when you see the likes of Pompey and the Optimates for the first time thinking, hold on a minute, this... They, they'd sat uncomfortably alongside each other. I remember um, uh, Caesar's daughter married Pompey, died in childbirth. Back when Caesar learned that, he was in Britain, by the way. Um, they sat uncomfortably alongside each other, the left and the right wing of Roman politics, um, for, for a two or three, for well, a couple of decades maybe. Then suddenly you can see the penny drop in the mid 50s as Caesar really is beginning to conquer Gaul. That actually this guy's outperforming everybody getting too big for his boots. Um, and the Romans didn't really like, you know, they didn't have kings. They 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 worshiped they 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 internally worshiped the fact that they got rid of their own kings 
talk and the proud in Flavin on BC, and they 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 were proud of the fact that they were they were you know they were the Romans. <clears throat> um, we're all the same. We're all equal. And then suddenly there's Caesar sort of jumping ahead, <clears throat> and actually, from that point onwards, Caesar outperforms anybody in the political classes. And through to the mid 40s BC, as he's now fighting, having conquered Gaul, the civil wars against the Pompeians in Macedonia and in Greece, uh, where he defeats Pompeii, and then in North Africa, and then finally in Spain, um, he becomes so dominant in Rome, becomes a full dictator, effectively, um, that it sets him against not just the Optimates, the reactionaries, the pro Senate party, but against all of the aristocracy, because suddenly everybody's seeing that Caesar's getting so big for his boots that he's actually threatening the entire way of life of the ruling classes in Rome. That's why he's assassinated, because ultimately he's so incredibly successful. You also get a sense as well with Alexander; he he was used to being aloof. Uh, he was the king; he was brought up to be the king. Um, and although he was maybe the first among equals amongst the Macedonian nobility, he was the king, you know, whereas Caesar wasn't brought up to that. So it must have been an interesting psychologically for Caesar to find himself, suddenly find himself master of both, uh, of his entire known world. I mean, it's interesting what that would have done to his personality. And maybe that's reflected in the fact that he's assassinated in 44 BC. Yeah, that's uh, it's uh, it's a massive, you know, if you're not, taught how to deal with that pressure taught how to deal with that amount of of power um it can we can see it has a massive effect on some people and that relationship with the nobility is probably a symptom of it does alexander have a different relationship with his nobility then um he he does now now with the macedonian nobility they're very hard drinking and uh they were encouraged to tell the king what they thought, especially when they'd had a drink. Uh, and Alexander himself drank a lot. And that caused a lot of conflict, actually. But it's the kind of thing where you have the conflict and you wake up the following morning, you're all best friends again. So that was a normal part of Macedonian culture. However, as <clears throat> Alexander continued his conquest of first the Persian Empire, and then he goes into Central Asia and Afghanistan, and then finally into the Punjab, and then back to Babylon. Um, his mindset is changing and he's clearly thinking something very different to what he wants his new empire to look like, to what the Macedonian nobility wanted to look like. Um, they're always questioning why he was wanting to go further and further and further, further east. And it was a, it was a, it was a mutiny by his own troops that stopped him going even further east than the Punjab. <clears throat> um, and uh, that caused huge amounts of friction, actually. With the nobility latterly, I mean, uh, uh, towards the end of his life, um, Alexander was recruiting Persians into the Macedonian army and into the the elite levels of the Macedonian army and the companion cavalry as well. It was causing problems, but even then, even then, given what he had achieved in conquering his entire known world, let's say that again, he conquered his entire known world. Um, they still loved him, I think. And actually, you can see an outpouring of affection at the point he dies. Um, whereas Caesar, at the point he dies, has managed to twist the entire ruling classes of Rome against him. So, a in really interesting parallel. That's why it's such an interesting book to write. Yeah, it, it, like, like you said, in some respects, they are so similar. And then in other respects, there are massive differences that set these two men... It, at polar opposites and it's it's nice to see nice to see that they're not just the same people so many years after um but these two men are at their core military commanders uh, and they have an impressive cv per se now what was for you what is alexander's most impressive military feat and and why do you think it's his most impressive military feat uh battle of gorgamila uh where he defeats uh Darius the Third for the for the final time, he defeated the Persians <clears throat> twice already. Latterly, Darius the Third, the first time, but this is the big set piece battle. So he forces a meeting engagement um, by storming down the Tigris Valley 
to, to Gorgomila, forces Darius to fight him um, at a place of his choosing. Uh, even then, Darius is uh, outnumbering him, maybe odds of four or five to one. Um, in terms of cavalry, maybe ten to one. Uh, and the best troops in the Persian army are the cavalry. And Alexander just comes up with this amazing battle plan where he knows he's going to be outnumbered. He knows he's going to be outflanked. He knows his best chance of winning is to go for the sort of the chicken head scenario by trying to take Darius out. So he devises a plan where he's going to thin Darius' front line to expose the king. <clears throat> um, and he deploys effectively in a square. So he has his phalanx in the front, cavalry on the flanks, more troops down the sides, and then the Greek mercenary hoplites to the rear in case the whole lot is enveloped. And then the hoplites at the rear can turn around and protect the rear. It's a very clever deployment. And then he just waits for the right moment. His strategy works. The, the ranks of the Persian cavalry thin. And then he goes straight for Darius, and Darius runs away, you know, flees. And uh, the Persian army collapses around him. So that's the A game battle for. Uh, that's the absolute A game battle for. Um, Alexander the Great. There are many others, but that's the A-game battle, I think, for Alexander the Great. Julius yeah. Caesar, um, well, his worst campaign, to add value, was his first invasion of Britain in 55 BC, when he could easily have lost two whole legions, that's 12, 10, 11, 12,000 men. Uh, his best battle he fought was probably the Battle of Pharsalus, where he defeated Pompey um, uh, in northeastern Greece. The reason being that here it's a civil war. Civil wars are very brutal, Jackson, because everybody's got everything to lose. Very little court is often given in civil wars. You can see it in the world in which we live today. Um, very little, very very little court is given because so much is at stake. The entire future for the ruling classes and the rest of a given society. So they t tend to be very bloody affairs. Think of the Battle of Towson and the Wars of the Roses as an example. The, the bloodiest battle in British history. So, so at Pharsalus, Pompey outnumbers uh, Caesar and has more cavalry. So his flanks should be super secure. And Caesar comes up with a really fantastic deployment where he effectively has a hidden reserve of legionaries. He knows full well that one of his flanks is going to probably fall. Um, because of the superiority there of the uh, of Pompey's cavalry, and he therefore deploys this sort of hidden reserve ready to pounce, and it does, and it, it wins the day for him. And also here, Caesar shows incredible command and control on the battlefield, picking out the weaknesses in the opposing line and exploiting it with his own legionaries till he's ultimately successful, and Pompey flees, goes to Egypt, lands in Alexandria, and at the very point he steps off the boat in Alexandria, Alexandria he gets beheaded. <laughs> So, 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 oh, it's, it's, it's a very serious way to lose Jackson. So that's probably Caesar's Caesar's a game battle. A, a, a game battle. A point I will make there, though, is that Caesar is fighting more or less his entire adult life, uh, and you know he's born in 100 BC, dies in 44 BC. So clearly. He's got decades on Alexander in terms of his adult fighting life. So Caesar's at play in the field for far longer than Alexander is. Alexander's career is this 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 tight ball of heroic activity, which set his world on fire. Where Caesar's just going on and on and achieving and achieving, and it's, it shows you there that that Caesar in particular had true grit because he kept going. He never stopped. He probably knew. Jackson, he knew that if he ever stopped, his creditors and his opponents and the political classes would catch up with him. <clears throat> so effectively, he was being driven by the by by the the fear of, of failure, and failure for him would have been ruin, either being killed or being bankrupted and his, his reputation being um, destroyed. So it's probably that which kept him going for a long time. Yeah, it, it certainly does see that he is being pushed um, or chased. Really, and that that pursuit of him does really push him on. I I I don't think either of them ever looked over their shoulder. I think they both had their eye on the horizon and kept going and going and going. Alexander the Great physically. <laughs> well, he always had troops behind him, so there's no need, is there? <laughs> and and then in terms of uh, 
looking over uh, your shoulder. It's an interesting uh, caveat that's very apt at this moment. Um, I want to look at the deaths of these two men uh, and how they met their ends. Um, and looking over one's shoulder is, is, is certainly more apt to one of these generals than the other. Uh, how do these two men meet their end, meet their demise? And what impact did that death have? With, with Alexander, I actually think that by the time he died, 32, uh, 32 years old, having conquered the known world, I think he was a broke, physically a broken man, actually. Uh, he spent his life, adult life militarily leading from the front, always in the front, thick of the action, frequently wounded, twice very seriously, latterly uh, in, in his Indian campaign where he had a lung pierced by the looks of it by an arrow. Um, and he recovered to an extent but also you've got to bear in mind this is a life on very physical military campaigning latterly sort of in the in the jungles in the Punjab etc or in the mountains in Afghanistan and and, and every and the deserts of Gan, uh, uh, Gadrosia and everything in between um, so physically I think at the point he died he was a, he was a physically broken man actually also mentally I think by this point in his life in his early 30s you could make the case that he was almost psychotic because he must have been absolutely racked and riddled with sort of what we today would call PTSD. He'd been in the thick of fighting his entire life. He'd known nothing but life on campaign. He, even with the luxury which being the king could throw at him, he, he starred himself as, as, as a leader among equals. So, so he'd have um, he would, he'd endured things as his men did as well. So I think physically he was a broken man. And I think also mentally he was probably not in a very good place either. And um, I think um, allegedly dies of natural causes. There's there's stories that he was poisoned in Babylon. There's stories that he drank himself to death. Looks as though he died of natural causes, maybe from a, fe a fever from something. Um, but when his body was at a very low ebb, so maybe a year, a few years earlier, it wouldn't have killed him. But it just in that one very narrow window of time, when he not had chance to heal physically and mentally, he just caught him out and, and um, he he died. C Caesar. There's a huge amount of hubris about the way Caesar dies because Caesar could easily have avoided being assassinated. He got loads of opportunities to learn from people saying, you know, you're about to be assassinated. And he ignored lots and lots of, um, lots of, lots of even direct comments saying that these guys are going to assassinate you. And there's a degree of hubris there, actually. Um, or fatalism, I don't know. Hubris, fatalism. Um, but I don't think Caesar needed to die the day he died. Actually, I think if it had taken account of what he had been told, he'd have survived. And 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 why why did they want to assassinate Caesar? Because he ate it, basically set himself up as the new king, in all but name. Uh, he was the dictator, he was dictator for life. Uh, he, he was fabulously wealthy by this time. Uh, he got his association with Cleopatra, <clears throat> which put the backs up of the the, the political classes in Rome. Um, and and he'd risen, he basically got too big for his boots, <laughs> which is which is a, it sounds unusual. So, so, sounds unusual, even today, for for somebody being too big for the boots in what Western liberal democracy to get put down. But actually, there in Republican Rome, being too big for your boat boots, if you got too big for your boots, you 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 ended up with everybody against you because everybody was fearful that there'd be a return to the monarchy. Of course, what happens is, of course, that there is a return to the monarchy. Twenty seven BC. Augustus is named the uh, Augustus, the last man standing from the last round of Republican civil wars, which were initiated by the assassination of Caesar, um, uh, uh, becomes the emperor. Augustus becomes the emperor. So actually, bizarrely, the, the, the liberators, as they style themselves, your Cassiuses and your Brutuses, etc., who wanted to save the Roman Republic, ultimately set in train the means by which it was actually brought down and an emperor was set in place and it's it's interesting that they, you know I, I like that point that everything they fought against caesar on was eventually became inevitable uh, and became the practice of the roman empire now if that's the impact of caesar's death on rome what's the impact of alexander's death on macedonia in actual fact, there's a similarity between the two of them in this. Neither of them set in place uh, a political settlement in terms of what would happen when they died. So you end up with the final spiral of civil wars in Republican Rome, which leads to the empire. Similarly, Alexander had created this vast... If you, if you, imagine, if you imagine this territory okay, for Alexander, which goes all the way from the Balkans to the Punjab, 
it includes the 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 Achaemenid Persian Empire, which was the richest part of that known world by a factor of ten. So Alexander had inherited not only his own known world but the wealth of it. So these guys, these fairly young men, to be honest, the people who were his generals were fairly young men. Ptolemy, Seleucus, Antigonus. Um, they'd inherited the money at the point he died. And because he got no political settlement in place, <clears throat> didn't say he was going to take over, allegedly. Theref therefore, within a short space of... You can, you can imagine this scene. I love this scene, Jackson, where it's a, it's a darkened bedroom in... Um, Dark and royal bedroom in Babylon, um, and there's a, there's a fan going on the ceiling. Alexander White expires, and and all these young men who followed him around his conquest of the known world start staring across the deathbed at each other. Who's going to make a move? Who's going to be the first one to make a move? Who's going to crack? What do you want to do? And it's it's within a it, it, take. It only takes a few hours before it all starts kicking off. And then you end up with four decades worth of the, the wars of the successors, which break up his empire into chunks. The Ptolemaic Empire in Egypt, the Seleucid Empire in, in, in the Levant um, through to the Punjab, um, the, the Macedonian Kingdom, etc. So all of a sudden, this homogenous huge empire, which he's created, goes that means that when the romans much later start looking towards the eastern mediterranean having defeated carthage it's much easier for them to pick these alexandrian successor states off one by one than if it had been one whole and it's interesting it's one of the great what ifs in history uh, alexander allegedly his next campaign was going to be against the um, arabian peninsula and then after that apparently waiting to see him in babylon at the point he died were ambassadors from Italy. So allegedly he was going to turn his sights towards Italy. So the world which we know today would have been completely different. Um, so neither of them set in place a political settlement. And because of their own achievements, that created chaos, which led to huge amounts of bloodshed and a completely different world. I think, oh, you know, who needs who needs Game of Thrones when you have uh, the wars of succession after after Alexander's death and, and Caesar's death, I think they would be incredible uh, moments to see dramatised and to just watch unfold because they are, you know, as you've said, just utter chaos. Both of their stories are more Game of Thrones than Game of Thrones and are more Lord of the Rings than Lord of the Rings. And they're real. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the best thing about history is you can borrow from it as much as you want, but you'll never beat the true <laughs> the true moments and the chaos. Damn right, mate. Now, a final fun question. Yeah. <laughs> now, a final fun question for you, Simon. Now, you've worked with some of the biggest companies I in history, History Hits, and this is a fun, well, this is a fun kind of question we do with all our guests here at History Jackson. What has been the most exciting project that you've been involved with so far in your career? Uh, right, there's too many to choose from, so I'm just going to pick one from this year. And actually, it's not writing a book. It's actually, it's actually tour. It's, it's actually going. Um, one of the things I do is I lead tours for travel companies around archaeological sites in the Mediterranean. And this year, for the first time, I got to go to Rome in North Africa, <clears throat> which is, plays a huge part, certainly in the story of Rome. Um, and I went to Algeria, and I ended up finding, uh, way off the beaten track. The um, one of one of the one of the, my, my heroes in history is Septimius Severus, the Roman Emperor Septimius Severus, Roman Britain's African Emperor. But there's another great African figure in British history. who's called Lollius Urbicus, who was the governor in the mid uh, second century AD, who uh, who's the guy who was tasked with by Antoninus Pius to drive the northern frontier of Britain from Hadrian's Wall up to the Antonine Wall, and he was he was a Berber from Numidia, <clears throat> and uh, on my tour this year two to uh, Roman Algeria I ended up finding his tomb and it was one of those moments I, I, I just and it's one of these huge sort of rotunda sort of tombs overlooking and Roman North Africa is very green by the way the whole it's, it's nothing like you expect at all it's incredibly green it's like Rohan actually 
talking the Lord of the Rings. It's exactly like Rohan. It's good cavalry country, good cavalry country, uh, and and this this sort of region where in the Atlas Mountains where I found his tomb. It's like being in sort of the Yorkshire Dales, and you've got these huge rolling hillsides and crags, and then these fast running uh, mountain streams in the bottom, and sort of where three or four of these valleys come together right on the top. Uh, and it really is out of Lord of the Rings. You've got this rotunda tomb, this huge thing, which was the tomb of the man who is a North African Numidian Berber who drove the line of Roman control in Britain to its furthest north ever, which means that he drove the line of Roman control anywhere in the empire to its furthest north. And I found his tomb. Mental. Amazing. Mind-blowing. Mind blowing! Oh wow! Uh, and and for that just to be the best experience of this year, um, you know, after so many years of not being able to get out as a an, as an archaeologist and as a tour guide, you're so you're you're so yeah, you're so right, so right, and it's just like um, it's like being Indiana Jones in real life, mate. <laughs> Our discussion today, Simon, has been on your book uh, from Pen and Sword, Alexander the Great versus Julius Caesar. Where can people get a copy of your book because you know you're you're an amazing speaker you're an amazing author and that your writing style is is brilliant people are going to want to read this book so where can they grab a copy firstly again thank you for doing my pr there jackson uh, you can find it in all good bookstores and it's in if you want to buy it physically it's in most <clears throat> waterstones for example or blackwells um etc and uh, it's on all major sort of uh, uh, uh websites amazon uh waterstones again anything uh, if you're in the states bars and noble it's it's, it's cross all all platforms if our listeners want to go away and learn more about the topic or specific details on caesar and alexander what do you recommend they go away and read or or listen to uh for anything to do with the hellenistic world i always say the starting point for me is probably 1990 peter green alexander versus actium uh, sorry alexander alexander uh Alexander to Actium, which basically tells the entire story of Alexander the Great through to what Peter Green defines as the, the the end of the Hellenistic world and the rise of Rome, which is an amazing, amazing book. With Julius Caesar, uh, I've got my own biography of Julius Caesar, Rome's greatest warlord, uh, which is a sort of a primer. So if you want to get a starting point to learn about Caesar, you can build out from before you turn to the likes of Adrian Goldsworthy, etc. Then try my um, Julius Caesar, Rome's greatest warlord. Oh, fantastic and i'll make sure links to your book and and those books are in the description below for our listeners now if they want to interact with you so if you want to try my if, if you google my name the first debate uh, literally the first thing you'll find if you google my name is my website which is <clears throat> um uh simon elliott 20 but it's, uh, if you google it you'll, it's the first thing you'll find and if you want to follow me on twitter it's at simon elliott 20 that's that's very useful if you're interested in primary research because I post up all of my latest research for free up there and let people use uh, access it. And also, as I'm travelling around the, the the Roman or classical world, I take thousands of photographs and I publish them all up there, and anybody can use them for free. Now, if you guys enjoyed this episode, please make sure you like, review, and share. Um, you know, this is a fantastic episode, and Simon's got so much great knowledge to share with the world. And thank you very much for listening, guys. And in the meantime, if you want to keep up to date with everything History Jackson related, please make sure you head to our social medias with the links in below or the website, which is www.historyofjackson.co.uk. Thank you very much for listening, guys, and I'll catch you next podcast episode.